Hello, and welcome to this, uh, the last session of this fantastic uh, conference called uh, Under One Sky. I am the host of, uh, of this uh, amazing 24 hours event that covers all the topics uh, around the world and uh, different topics uh, related to the, the our care of the night. I am Paulina Villalobos. I am uh, a lighting designer and also one of the members of the board of directors from uh, inter the International Dark Sky Association. Uh, this session, uh, after we started, because here I have uh, my planet, uh, we started here uh, in this area and go and went all the, around the world and we arrived to the Americas. And uh, from North, Central and South America, uh, we will present uh, Jaime Folich, Pedro Sangüesa and Ravis Henry. Uh, from the topic of uh, tourist, tourism, astronomy, heritage and the cultural perspective, uh, I am very honored to be part of this uh, uh, session and uh, from the point of view of, of lighting design. Uh, personally, I grew up in the Atacama Desert the driest place on earth and also is the starriest place on earth. It's the cleanest place where you can see the stars in an amazing way and uh, it also holds all the main uh, astronomy, uh, astronomical obs observatories. 50% of, of the astronomical observation is placed there. And then I moved to study architecture and lighting design and from the lighting design point of view, you want to lead everything, but there is a limit. And that limit was, um, uh, I, I realized it when uh, it, uh, when, I, when I missed and I was in contact with all the people from the astronomical world. Uh, so from that, point of view, it's, it's very important to uh, connect each other and connect all the different perspectives to protect the skies and protect light pollution, not only for astronomical and science, environmental, but also from the quality of life and, uh, and all the things related to design, science and heritage. So, uh, before we start this uh, presentation, I will also uh, want to um, welcome all of you. Uh, I know that almost 2,000 people have, uh, are uh, part of this uh, global conference. Uh, remind, reminding you that you can you have all you have the possibility to have a, tr a translation in the cc button just uh, down on your screen to have the translation to the language that is it suits you better and um, also it, we are welcome to have uh, to make all the questions and uh, we are uh, also taking the chat to see where are you uh, staying and and from which part of the world you are hearing from us. So uh, it's amazing. So people from all continents, Italy, Croatia, USA, Aruba, fantastic. So, and also um, remind you that there is a code of conduct. So if everybody's welcome, you can chat and just give us a, creative and positive feedbacks and make all the questions that you want to to make to the audience um, so with uh, with this uh, um, introduction i would like to uh, introduce intro uh, make the introduction for our first speaker Jairo Frolich. Jairo Frolich is from aruba 
and his talk is about light pollution, why so mysterious. Jairo Hulik is an electrical engineer, is an astrophotographer, and since 2018, he is a co-founder and current president of the Space and Nature Aruba Foundation, an astronomy and general science organization on the island of Aruba. Aruba has become a large tourist heaven in recent years, with an estimated 2 million people visiting yearly. About 50% of those tourists travel from large cities where light pollution is significant. Gazing into the night in Aruba, they are amazed and in awe. Unfortunately, light pollution is still is unknown with the other community and the value it can present is still not prioritized. This presentation will briefly illustrate some of the steps as an advocate they are taking while going the knowledge about the topic of light pollution within the Aruba community. So, welcome, Jairo, and uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Paulina. Thank you very much. Um, for me, it's an honor to be here with you today, talking to you again uh, from the wonderful island for, of Aruba in the Caribbean. Let me start my presentation right away, sharing screen. Okay, hopefully everybody can see my screen. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Perfect, perfect. Thank you very much for confirming that. Yes. Um, so again, my name is Hairo Vrolik. Thank you again for uh, for um, hearing me today from this uh, side of the region. Um, I'm the co-founder of uh, Space and Nature Aruba Foundation, and our main goal is to bring astronomy and earth science to the community and through education, scientific research, and fun events. Um, I'm also an avid astrophotographer and a proud member of the IDA delegate community. Um, for me, it's an honor to be here today and share some information about this part of the world. So let's get started. The goal of my presentation is to share what we as IDA delegates are doing to raise awareness in this part of the region so um, light pollution is still a relatively low priority topic and not so much talked about um, in our community. So, and especially on the ABC islands. Uh, therefore, we set a goal to measure uh, the knowledge of our community on this topic so that we could uh, provide better recommendation and practical solution, not only for uh, our community, um, but also for our governmental institutions. So my presentation today is uh, sections in five parts. I'm going to be talking a little bit about the ABC Islands, uh, where they're located actually, um, the challenges, of course, that we face with the light pollution, and um, what we as delegates are doing to quantify the knowledge of light pollution and artificial lighting within our community. Um, of course, we do have already successes um, and also what we as delegates uh, will be doing as next steps. So um, where exactly is Aruba located? You might be wondering. Aruba forms part of a group of islands uh, called the ABC Islands, consisting of Aruba, Bonaire, and Curaçao. Um, these are the westernmost uh, islands in the in the Leeward Antilles um, in the Caribbean Sea. So Aruba and Curaçao are autonomous, so self-governing countries of the Kingdom of the Netherlands, while Bonaire is a separate municipality of the Netherlands. You can consider Bonaire like um, Rotterdam or Amsterdam um, in the Netherlands. Okay, so by far, Aruba is the most densest, densest island um, between the three, um, with approximately over 600 people per square kilometer, which also plays 
uh, a significant role on the impact of light pollution as well. So I'm in, I'm in based on the uh, on the Caribbean island of Aruba. So um, as a proud member of the uh, IDA delegate community, which if you open up uh, the map of IDA, you will only find me in that area. So um, we hope to spark uh, initiative within uh, the other three islands as well, to, so that we can have um, many more delegates in this region as well. So as you can see here, here's a map of the light, uh, uh, how is light distribution across the island of Aruba. So um, luckily, uh, um, as you can see uh, as well, uh, amongst the three islands, Aruba has the, has the most significant light pollution amongst the three. So um, luckily, we do have a national park, which is called uh, Arikok National Park. Also, you can see where exactly the light pollution is concentrated. Of course, it is the capital of Aruba, which is called Oranjestad. So um, in, the, in the National Art uh, Park, we have, uh, um, it's uh, the most diverse, biodiverse um, sections of the island. We have uh, um, unique animals in this region. Amongst them are the Aruban rattlesnake. This is only found on the island uh, of Aruba. We also call it the cascabel. And we also have the, um, the Aruban boroughy owl, which we call um, the shoko. So being an island, um, it has uh, uh, um, the most impact of the, of course, the sea turtles. So um, uh, what we, we have regularly or receive on the island regularly are three types of sea turtles. Amongst them are the leatherback, the green turtle, and the loggerhead, and also the hexbill. So although assessments have been performed and guidelines have been created for the developing hotels, it is still a challenge. Um, and uh, um, Aruba is actually, or the whole Caribbean, is also a, a, a sea turtle heaven because um, it is so warm, um, and what we notice is that um, it is most um, abundant of female sea turtles. So that is something that we need to, to consider and protect as well. So I have the honor to, to talk to one of the earliest and amongst uh, um, dedicated organizations aiming to protect the, and rescue the sea turtles on the island. This is called um, Tortuga Ruba. Um, and I have here with you today um, from an, a recorded interview, of course, um, Edith and Richard van der Waal from the Tortuga Aruba Foundation. Okay, let me just um, put- Bon on. dia. Hopefully everybody- Dear Jairo, it's an honor for the Tortuga Aruba Foundation to be interviewed and address your audience. Tortuga Aruba, is the Aruban Foundation for the Conservation of Sea Turtles. We are existing about 20 years. Sea turtles are marine reptiles swimming in our oceans for millions of years. All ecosystems on planet Earth have developed under the rhythm of sunlight and days and the dark night. Sea turtles, and especially their reproduction cycle, is adapted and relying on this rhythm. Oh, sorry about that. <laughs> Let me just bon dia. Dear Jairo, it's an honor for the Tortuga Aruba Foundation to be interviewed and address your audience. Tortuga Aruba is the Aruban Foundation for the Conservation of Sea Turtles. We are existing about 20 years. Sea turtles are marine reptiles swimming in our oceans for millions of years. All ecosystems on planet Earth have developed under the rhythm of sunlight and days and the dark night. Sea turtles, and especially their reproduction cycle, is adapted and relying on this rhythm. Sea turtles dig the dark. Adult females come ashore at night to make their nest and lay their eggs. These eggs incubate in the warm, sandy beaches. 
after about two months, yeah, the head, the X hatch and the Sorry about that, um, guys. My my presentation is constantly automatically changing. Um, I will continue and um, hopefully at the end I can play um, the video again. Um, so let me continue with the presentation, um, the challenges. So of course, um, not only sea turtles are the challenge. Um, and um, however, we do have uh, the effects of the hotels and um, the condominium development. This has been growing um, since before COVID and after COVID um, a lot, as uh, already Paulina mentioned that um, Aruba since the post COVID is reaching the average again of 2 million visitors per year on the island. So um, that again is becoming a challenge and without awareness and continuous awareness um, for the hotel developments, this will continue to become a challenge. So, um, here you can see many uh, advertisements, not only at near the, um, the, the capital of Aruba, but also at um, different parts of Aruba, hotels are being developed. So this is uh, very challenging on the island. Hopefully as delegates, we can um, um, spark something within the developers to do something about it. And of course, um, we will be proudly and happily um, available to provide all of the necessary information to mitigate these and install all of the, the uh, lighting systems accordingly as well. So um, what we did is as delegates and, 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 and also to quantify the knowledge of our community with regards to light pollution, is to perform an online survey. So recently we have performed, um, within two weeks, we received about 130 participants. The, the survey um, consisted of 10 simple questions. And for me, uh, it was a surprising result because for me, I thought the community wasn't aware uh, of, of what actually is light pollution and artificial lighting. So, um, as you can see here from some of the results um, that people do know what causes and the impacts of light pollution. However, I believe that the people do not have, for example, uh, uh, a point of information to go to and receive how these uh, lighting and what they can do to, um, to you know, to do proper installation of the, the lighting system. So I believe with now we have a delegate and with the help of IDA as well, and all of the resources that they have, we can reach a good and proper information bank so, such that we can share it to our um, within our community as well. So um, a little bit about the successes. Um, uh, not only based on the survey that we receive a good input and feedback and results, but also since doing the starting the awareness um, within our uh, own astronomy uh, organization sessions and such, we have also uh, started to capture the interest of uh, local newspapers and TV programs. So this is a good, uh, good start. Um, uh, as you can see here, we have a whole section of a local paper written about the impact. So um, I believe if we can do that and reach the attention of the local um, um, newspapers, um, we can uh, also reach the attention of our government institutions and also the community in that sense. So um, a little bit more about the successes. Um, According to the, um, the Sea Turtle Organization, it was it is the first time that, uh, as you can see here on the screen, that NV Elmar is our um, distribution company, which are responsible for uh, the operation and maintenance of all the lighting poles, street light poles across the island. So this is the first time 
that they have acknowledged the impact of light pollution on the island, especially um, they are collaborating to dim the lights, especially where the sea turtles are hatching. So this is a good news and it's a good initiative from the, um, the governmental institutions that they are doing their part as well. And on the right side, you can see a picture that we have also participated into a, the development of a new marine park um, on the island. This is an initiative from the local national park as well. So um, based with our input and with our efforts to raise awareness for the light pollution and its impact, I believe we can also, um, um, our information can reach way further par by participating in these uh, sessions as well. So um, what are the next steps? Um, since the um, founding of our astronomy organization, we have been performing a lot of um, lectures and sidewalk astronomies outreach events, which not only include um, astronomy sessions, but also to promote the light pollution impact as well. So as you can see here in some pictures, we have performed especially sidewalk astronomy in areas that uh, are very uh, much impacted by light pollution. And we received the questions, for example, why do you do sidewalk astronomy in this area because of the light pollution? So that's a catch that we can uh, start telling them about the the awareness and the impact such as, you know, to see the beautiful night sky, you will eventually indeed need a better, uh, a better location, a dark location, especially a dark sky as well. So what we will be doing next uh, are, of course, continue to provide the awareness to the community. Um, I have already especially started um, translating um, the IDA material on their website, the resources, brochures, flyers to our native language. So on the island, we speak um, we speak not only English, Spanish, and and Dutch, but however, we have our, our own native language, Papimento, as well. So um, also to consult with uh, organizations such as schools, um, um, scouting uh, groups so that we could provide not only the lectures based on astronomy again and other scientific approaches, but uh, of course, um, based on the impact of light pollution as well. So uh, one of the major uh, goals that we have is to reach out to the governmental institutions as well, and also to explain a little bit about not only the impact it has on the flora, fauna, and all living beings, but what they can do as well. So not only, again, the governmental institutions, so we can also reach further to, um, towards the uh, um, architectural institutions as well, so they can be aware on the impact. And also we will continue and enhance the collaboration with our national park so that we can uh, measure about um, set up uh, sensors, for example, to measure the development the developing light pollution and also brainstorm on what else we can do um, in, in a joint venture with the national park as well to, um, to you know, raise the awareness and mitigate um, all of the impact as well. So hopefully we can uh, work towards uh, uh, development and, and establishment of a, of a dark sky park and especially continue that as well to reach um, to uh, dark sky places across the island as well. So that uh, is uh, all. Um, as you can see, we have um, great challenges and great opportunities. And I think with your help, uh, we will meet all of the, the uh, and make all, uh, all of the best out of it. So. Thank you for your attention and hope I've managed to give you an idea of what we as delegates are doing uh, to raise awareness and combat the light pollution on the island. Thank you. So thank you very much, Jairo. It was really um, not just interesting, but uh, it's empowering how to 
to see how you are so involved and very active in the environmental and then uh, involving the educational, which I think is, is really relevant. Um, the, we have three very interesting questions, but we are going to uh, uh, tell them again four very interesting questions at the end of this session. So we have 20 minutes at the end of these sessions to answer all the questions that the people are, are already making. Also to say thank you to everybody in the, in the chat. Uh, we have people from Puerto Rico, USA, Mexico, Canada, UK, Scotland, USA, Uganda, Poland, Chile, Croatia, Italy, Aruba, of course, Portugal, New Zealand, Spain, Germany, South Africa, and many, many from the USA that I cannot wrap them up, but it's, uh, it's really global. So, um, super interesting. We are going to get back to you at the end of this, uh, of, of, of uh, Ravi's uh, presentation. So now we are getting ready to receive Pedro Sangüesa. Pedro Sangüesa is from Chile like me. So uh, he, his presentation, it's uh, called Towards a National Light Pollution Norm from Chile. Pedro Andres Sangüesa is the director of the Office for the Protection of the Night Sky of Northern Chile, OPCC, which is the Spanish uh, mm -hmm. name, created 22 years ago by the former National Commission for the Environment, it's a currently the Ministry of Environment, the AURA Observatory, CARSO, and ESO Observatory. Now, we are talking here about the major observatories of, of planet Earth, so it's really uh, big. Recently, the GMTO joined this effort too. Previously, uh, Pedro was in charge of the creation of the regional office of the environment in the Coquimbo region. So this talk will focus on the new regulations for protecting the night skies and, in, and its emphasis on shifting towards the environmental protection, with main restriction being fully shielded pictures of outdoor street lighting, industry, road lighting, vehicles and sport facilities. So thank you very much, Pedro, to be with us. And uh, now all the, the floor is yours. Well, thank you, Paulina. I will share the, the screen. And let me for a moment to Okay, well, super. Yep. Yeah. That's in the beginning. <laughs> I hope you see the presentation. Yes, perfect. Okay, thank you, Paulina. Well, we have a presentation uh, focused, as she said, uh, on our new light pollution standard. And first of all, I have to thank all of you for this opportunity uh, to share our experience uh, in the protection of the night nice sky with the OPCC, the Office for the Protection of the Night nice Sky for Northern Chile, depend on the our Observatory in an agreement with the Ministry of Environment in of our country. Also the European Southern Observatory is part of our effort and we provide uh, technical support to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in light pollution issues and, and also in satellites constellation matters. And we are also related with the UNOSA, which is the uh, United Nations Office for uh, Outer Space Affairs, and also uh, provide support to the International Astronomical Union in, of course, in the, in the same area. Well, as Paulina was explaining, uh, Chile has become uh, one of the most important places for astronomical observation around the world. And thanks to our geographical conditions, our infrastructure, uh, many universities and scientific consortiums have chosen our territory uh, in order to install and operate some of the most advanced astronomical observatories in the world. 
here we have some photos of the, the main of them. You can, these are the main international observatories have been operated in Northern Chile. Uh, on the right, we show some images of the new generation of big telescopes that are currently being built. They are very uh, huge telescopes and we hope to keep our nice sky protected for many years for the science that they have to create for humanity. And also, uh, not only big telescopes are built and operated in Chile. There is also a wide variety of options at local levels across the country. And this uh, variety of options is wide. There are communal, municipal observatories, hotels, cabins, and campsites with telescopes. And even we have independent guides offering tours of the Andean Cosmovision and also astrophotography. But the substantial increase in artificial light throughout the world has produced serious effects on the environment, altering reproduction, food supply, sleep, even the immune system of many species, and affecting even entire ecosystems just when we need to restore nature to control climate change, which is it's an incredible situation. Outdoor lighting is responsible for uh, uh, less than one percent of the gases that produces global warming. But uh, most of that light emission can be avoided and easily. Numerous scientific studies prove that light pollution is harmful uh, to human health and that exposed to artificial light at night decreases the production of the hormone melatonin, causing sleep disorders, increases stress, obesity, favoring the spread of some cancer like breast and prostate cancer. So all these previous antecedents led our Ministry of Environment to draft a national light pollution standard, which is soon to be approved. We hope so, in fact. It is based on the current light pollution standard, and it will demand elaboration of a study of environmental impact by projects that may generate light pollution in areas so established by the president of the Republic. And there is another standard which will define the areas of astronomical protection, uh, even the biodiversity protection areas. Well, the main restrictions that we have in our new standard. One of the main requirements of the current and the new light pollution norm is to avoid the emission of light over the, and near the horizontal, making mandatory a, a right angle installation of the luminaires. The emission of blue light is drastic, drastically minimized in astronomical zones and in sensitive areas for biodiversity. Nowadays, amber type lighting sources are the only ones that can meet the new standard in those protected areas. For the rest of the country, and I have to say that for the whole rest of the country, uh, which is, that's why we are talking about a new national light pollution norm, but for the rest of the country, ultra worldwide will be allowed. This means 7% of emission between 380 nanometers to four, 199 millimeters in respect to the visible spectrum. We are talking about ultra warm white light. So the typical white light will be forbidden in Chile in the coming years. And we hope so for the rest of the country very soon too. Regarding industrial lighting, we will abide the European regulations with some specific restrictions the lighting values indicated in this standard must not be exceeded by more than 20%. Uh, in those places where no war is being carried out, the lighting must be kept off or contemplated reduction of at least 50% of the star luminous flux. In the case of sport illumination, we will also follow the European norm in the case of amateur sport fields and recreational facilities, there is a spectral restriction of 50% of blue light 
For professional sport fields, the limit will be will be 20 percent. For both categories, the lighting levels will not exceed the same 20 percent limit of the minimum maintained average luminance, and curfew curfew will be applicable from midnight until dawn. In the case of ornamental and decorative lighting for protected area, the luminance must be equal or less than five candles per square meter. And in the rest of the country, that limit will be 10 candles per square meter. The lighting must be turned off from midnight to seven hours in a.m. In, in the case of the billboards, the limit of illuminated signs is 50 a, a candle per square meter and be installed horizontally. In the case of signs illuminated from outside, like the ones of the right in, in the image, the limit, they must be installed horizontally pointing down and must be fully shielded. In the case of the rest of the country, the new norm must be complied with uh, only when the luminar must be replaced due to failure of age, but in the case of the north part of the country or near the, the relevant biological sites, the limit will be two years. So uh, we think that if, if we have some more strict restriction in order to replace soon fixtures in places relevant for astronomy and for biodiversity, the, the orientation will be of the government in order to finance that will be to, to spend money in those areas, astronomic, near astronomical sites and near biodiversity sites. And for the rest of the country, of course, the limit will be more flexible. And just when the pictures has to be replaced because they are old or obsolete sense, for example, in only in that case, they must uh, comply the new standard, which is, I think is more, uh, it's not so heavy for the rest of the country or for our national budget to replace very soon thousands of pictures because of uh, the new norm. So only in the areas of astronomical relevance and biodiversity relevance will be pushing hard to replace soon the pictures. So this is uh, our new standard and we hope by the end of this year to have uh, this uh, new norm be approved. And that's all, uh, Paulina. So thank you, Pedro. That was, uh, uh, we have some time. So maybe uh, I would like to, to ask you some, Yes, we have uh, like a couple, two minutes left. So uh, there, this has been a long trip, I think, from uh, the late of the late nineties until now. So how do you perceive this uh, evolution in the regulation? Since nothing until now, probably one of the more most uh, strongest regulations for light pollution. Well, the restrictions by themselves, I think, are well-oriented. We are far beyond the restrictions suggested by the international organizations, uh, lighting organizations. But the problem is that we, we have a very weak system for enforcement. And, and I think that the most relevant issue for the near future more than the norm itself will be compliance. Mm. That's a problem that we have, but not only for uh, light pollution, but it is for all of the environmental restrictions, in fact. Mm. Yes, it's a weakness, but it's, it's, a, it's, it's really good to hear you summarizing everything and, and now realize that this is very strong regulation. So with this, I'll, Thank you very much for this presentation. There is some questions that we also will take them back uh, at the end of this session. So thank you very much, Pedro. And now, 
uh, we are going to present Ravis. So welcome Ravis. Uh, I'm very happy to introduce you. Uh, so Ravis Henry uh, is from the US and the presentation is the night sky through Navajo eyes. Ravis Henry belongs to the Navajo Towering House clan and is born for the Coyote Pass Jemez clan of the Navajo tribe. He originates from the place called Alamo, New Mexico, but was born and raised and still resides in the canyon, the Chelly, Tingle, so sorry if I mispronounce something, uh, Arizona, where he is currently uh, a park ranger with the National Park Service since 2009. He works, oh, he works in the field of interpretation and education, sharing the stories and history of his people with visitors from all around the world. Ravis is a traditional knowledge holder and storyteller for his people, and he's learning the ancient ceremonial ways of the Navajo. He is also an artist, silversmith, creating uh, pieces inspired by the stories of the land and his people. In this presentation, um, Ravis will introduce the Navajo, Navajo perspective of the night sky, briefly sharing the stories of how the stars came to be, the Navajo constellations, and the stories behind them. So thank you, Ravis, and you have the floor. Thank you. Yeah. Let me go ahead and uh, share my screen here in a bit. Okay. Can you confirm if my share my screen is being yes. shared? Perfect. Beautiful. Thank you. Um. Let me uh, first introduce myself, um, as it was stated, but I want to introduce myself formally um, in my native language. Um, so if you can bear along with me for the moment here. Henry I see late east so good afternoon, good morning, good evening, wherever you are um, in this beautiful world. My name is Ravis Henry, and I am of the Navajo tribe of the southwest region of the United States. And my um, my clans, um, which are part of my identity, I am Towering House clan born for the Coyote Pass Hamas clan. And my grandpas are the Salt People clan and Tangle People clan. And I originally come from a place called Alamo, New Mexico. That's where my mother is from. That's where my grandmother and grandfather resided. And that's where my umbilical cord is buried. And that's where my roots are. But I was born in Chinle, Arizona, and I was raised most of my life with my father's family out in uh, Chinle, Arizona, in the area of Canyon de Chez. Um, and Canyon de Chez National Monument is one of our beautiful parks. Uh, that's a part of the National Park Service system here in the United States. So just a little bit about where I'm at. Um, I work with the National Park Service um, in the field of interpretation with the Southern Four Corners groups of parks. And that includes Canyon de Chez National Monument, the Hubble Trading Post National Historical Site, and Navajo National Monument. But my focus area and my work site is at Canyon de Chez. And in Navajo, we call this place Tseyit, which translates to within the rocks. And it's a beautiful park in the middle of the Navajo Nation. It encompasses about uh, 125 square miles of canyons. And in this canyon, we are one of the only park units that still has many people living in the canyon. Um, in other words, the people here, we, um, we, they allow the park service to be here. And I am 
happy to, to say that, you know, my family is part of that. So I come from this canyon. I literally work at home and my family has been in this region for generations and we are still farmers. We are still knowledge holders of the land and the stories. And we take care of uh, our homestead and the ceremonies and the beautiful culture that we have embedded here at Canyon de Shea. Um, but I'm here this afternoon to speak to you all on a little bit about the stories of the stars. We had some great presentations here by the other two fellas um, talking about you know, the scientific aspects of the night sky and, and, and how they are being affected by light pollution. I wanna take a different approach and share with you all you know, how we as indigenous people of the land, as Navajo people, um, see the night sky. So I wanna take you on a little journey here just to story tell a little bit about you know, our, our perspectives, our views about how things came to be. And our stories of the stars began way back, you know, since time immemorial, you know, a time when there was no sun, there was no moon, there was no sense of time. And in this time, there was a, there was in this place, there was a, a place of darkness. And in this time of darkness is where our people begin our stories. And they talk about how our people migrated from, from different worlds, from the dark world into the blue world then migrating into the yellow world and into the glittering world, the world that we live in today. And part of our story talks about the stars. And there's a story of how our deities, as we pronounce them in our language, the holy beings or the holy people, came together to decide you know, on how they could do something for the people do something that could motivate and that could remind the people of the many different roles and responsibilities that we have as five-fingered people, as five-fingered people on this earth. And one of the ways that the deities decided to do this was to use crystals, use uh, leftover crystals from the creation of the sun and the moon. And using these crystals, these uh, chips and broken pieces of crystal quartz, the uh, talking God and the home God and the black God and the changing woman, the first man, the first woman, and all these uh, many other deities came together. And it said that they came to the home of black God, Hashtagin. And there at his home, Hashtagin, the black God, had a buckskin, a layer, a, a, a blanket of um, deer hide. And he laid that on the floor of his home, and on it were all these broken pieces of crystal quartz. And the deities began to talk, and they began to separate these crystal quartz. Then they began to make different designs, different symbols on this uh, buckskin hide. And the, when they came up with, a, with a, a design or an image, they decided a story or a teaching that would be tied to that design and image. And when they agreed upon it, they put those crystals up into the darkness, up into the sky. And slowly, little by little, in this darkness of the night sky, stars began to appear. And the deities worked together, putting stars one at a time, different images, different designs with different stories and teachings that would be utilized for us as five-fingered people to remind ourselves of who we are and our role and responsibility as a human being. During that process, it said that the coyote, the, who uh, we call Ma'i, was a uh, trickster and a very curious individual. He was also a deity as well. And the coyote, through his curiosity, began to see these crystals appear in the night sky. And he was curious on what they were. And he was curious on where they were coming from. So the coyote from there started to wander across the land until he came across the home of the black god and he saw light coming from inside the home. So he howled out as he normally does and began to make his way to the black god's home. And when he got closer to the home, the deities heard the coyote's howl. They heard him coming. Then the black god and the other deities told the others to be quiet, to sit quietly. We can't let the coyote know what we're doing. 
coyote is always coming with bad luck, with bad energy, and he's going to interfere with this process. So it said the black god grabbed a bundle of crystal quartz with that buckskin and hid it behind him. And at that point, the uh, coyote came knocking on the door, made himself, invited himself into the home. And he says, Yate He says, hello, greetings, everybody. What's going on here? And the holy people said to him, none of your business, coyote. We're talking about very important matters and none of this concerns you. And the coyote was, was curious still on what was happening. And he tried asking the deities what was, what was going on and if, if he could be invited, if he could help. But the deities insisted that the coyote leaves. They asked him to leave, saying that every time he comes, something bad happens. So the coyote got fed up and angry, and he left. He left in, in, in anger, running out that door. And he says, fine, I will leave then. And he ran out the door and he howled and he made it sound like he was running far, far away. He howled really loud and then it got faint and then it got quieter and quieter. Soon he stopped howling and the holy people began to get back to work. They said, the coyote has left. Let's get back to work. Black God put the blanket of deer hide back down and the crystal quartz back on top and the holy people got to work. The coyote, though, didn't actually run away. He made it sound like he went away, but he just ran a short distance from the home and he hid underneath a juniper tree. He crawled underneath that tree and he was looking towards the home and he could see underneath the door into the home of the black god. And he saw these crystals, all these glittering of crystals shimmering on that deer hide. And the coyote's eyes got big and the coyote got really, really curious and wanted to know what was happening. He soon learned that the de deities were taking these crystals and putting them up into the sky. And from there, he ran into the Hogan. He ran back into that Hogan, catching all the deities off guard. And he went straight to the middle of the Hogan where the blanket of uh, deer hide lay. He grabbed that deer hide and he threw it all the way up into the sky. And all those leftover crystal quartz went flying up into the night sky. And he scattered the remaining crystals all across the night sky. And that's how the stars came to be, how we see it today. And they say that the coyote put the blanket back down and he found one star left on that blanket. And he picked it up and he says, That's what he said, that this star here is going to be my star. All of you put something up there. Now this star is going to be me. And he put this star up into the southern hemisphere. And that's how the stars came to be. The stars in the night sky have always been a very important part for us as Navajo people. For us as Navajo people, uh, especially there at Canyon de Chez, we've utilized the rock walls and we've utilized uh, the natural resource to document, you know, our stories and to remind us of different teachings and events. And there in Canyon de Chez, we're reminded of how important the night sky is to us. Because in Canyon de Chez, there are many areas in alcoves, on the ceilings of alcoves and small caves and underneath ledges where we see symbols like this here on the screen. We see marks of plus signs or X signs. And these are rock art images. These are rock art that were created by our people, our ancestors. And on these rock art images, they might look like crosses and pluses, but these are actually constellations and these are stars. This is our interpretation of the night sky as Navajo people that our ancestors observed and, and documented. So the night sky has been a very big, important part of our role as Navajo people. We use it to navigate the night sky. We use the night sky to also uh, remind us of what season we're in and what activities and ceremonies we can practice and we can do. Um, and from there, we have one constellation that doesn't move or one star that doesn't move. And most of us in the Northern Hemisphere are able to see this. And this star that doesn't move, majority of us know it as Polaris. 
um, also known as the North Star. And that's a very important um, star for our people as all the other stars revolve around it. They move around that one single star. And that one star um, is a symbol of the fireplace. If we look at the night sky and look at it as a home, then that one single star is the fireplace and everything removes around it, revolves around it. Um, just like in our traditional Navajo homes, which are round structures, we enter, we enter our home from the east and inside of our home and the center of our home is the fireplace. And when we enter our home, we always go clockwise. We always move around that fireplace. We're always revolving. And that fireplace is considered the heart of the home. It is the light. It is the warmth. It is the energy of the home. And in the night sky, that dark, uh, that north star, the Polaris, is that fireplace of the night sky. It's the heart. It's the center. And everything revolves around it, according to our view, for those of us in the northern hemisphere. And we watch this star throughout the different seasons, and we have different constellations that revolve around it, prominent constellations that we see. And one of those is the Big Dipper. And the Big Dipper, also known as Polaris Major, Ursa Major, um, is one of the most prominent constellations we see from our view here on Navajo land. And we watch it throughout the year, we watch it throughout the seasons. And when we watch it, we, we have a design, we have a, we have a, a, um, a symbol that comes into, into view. And this is a symbol that our people have been using for, for thousands of years. We utilize this symbol um, in our art. We utilize this symbol in our blankets, in our weaving, in our sand paintings. It's depicted on the rock walls and forms of rock art that date back to hundreds and thousands of years. And for us, this symbol, it's a symbol of life. It's a symbol of, of um, you know, change through the different seasons, through the times of day from the sun rise through the blue sky to the sunset back into darkness. It's a symbol of life representing our four stages of life from birth, childhood, adolescence to adult years and, uh, and back into our elder years into old age. So this symbol encompasses all of that and it comes from the night sky as we watch the stars and constellations revolve around that North Star. And this symbol here we identify and call it in our language as Tsunayo Ese, which translates to that um, twirling logs, which is the motion that we're seeing there. So this symbol here is a very sacred symbol for our people, as it is for many other cultures around the world as well. Um, and we see this in the night sky. But we have many constellations um, that are significant to the Navajo people. And some of these constellations are shared by other stories and cultures from around the world. Um, in this uh, slide here, you can see three photos, and in the center, you can see um, the image of the fireplace. And that fire is the North Star, that North Star light that I've been talking about. Um, we call it Nahokonspakon. Nahokons is the Navajo word for the northward direction. And Nahokons is actually describing that revolving motion as we look into the night sky, how everything revolves and rotates around that North Star. So that's the term Nahokons. So we call the star here in our language, the North Star Nahokons Bekon, which is the fire of the North. The, Im the image there on your left is, is the Big Dipper or Ursa Major. And we call this Nahokons Bekon. And Nahokons Bekon is a symbol of fatherhood. He's a reminder of our roles and responsibilities for those of us who are men, who are male. He's a symbol and a, and a um, a, a person who represents all of our fathers, our uncles, our grandfathers, our brothers, our nephews, our sons, and our grandsons. And he teaches us, you know, the responsibilities of manhood, fatherhood, what it means to be a caretaker of a home. He reminds us of our responsibility to be the protectors and the, um, the one to teach prayer and ceremony to the family and, the, and, and to the children. And he is always rotating around this fireplace and can be seen um, in the northern hemisphere year round. And opposite from him on the other side of the fireplace is Cassiopeia. And Cassiopeia um, for us in Navajo is pronounced Nahokonspa'adi, 
which is the female revolving one. And she is a symbol of our mothers. Uh, she is a representation of our mothers, our aunts, our grandmothers, our sisters, our daughters, our nieces, our granddaughters. And she reminds our people of what it means to be you know, a woman, the roles and responsibilities of motherhood, to be the first to, to instill care, love, and compassion into the home, and to teach the basic, foundation, basic foundations of life to the children. <clears throat> so she's a representation of our women. And these are the three prominent constellations that are very important for us. And these were constellations in our stories created by the holy people with these stories and teachings. Another very important constellation that I, I want to I want to talk about here is uh, one that we call uh, and most people know this as the seven sisters in the United States and other places around the world. It's known as Pleiades and Pleiades or Dilyeha is one of the constellations that we as Navajo people watch year round because this one is one that tells us when to have specific ceremonies and when to do certain activities. And the first activity that's tied to this constellation is our farming and planting. And it's where the Navajo word Dilyeha comes from, comes from the Navajo word Ketilye. And Ketilye is a Navajo word for farming or planting. And they say that Dilyeha is prominent throughout the night sky um, throughout the year. But there's one time of the year where it's very hard and rare to actually see this constellation. And we say that this constellation actually disappears for, for several weeks from our review here, from our view and perspective here on Navajo land. And they say that when that constellation of Dilyeha or Pleiades disappears, that's when we plant our seeds. That's when we put our seeds into the ground. And that is when, you know, we take care of our crops and our fields. And this time of year is usually in the month of April, uh, late April through the month of May. They say that if we plant um, our seeds when Dilyeha is still here, that'll be early, uh, early to mid spring. And by that time, Dilyeha or these seven naughty boys, as, as we talk about them in our language, uh, these naughty boys here are going to end up destroying our crops by bringing snow and frost to our people and destroying the fields, freezing the, freezing the seeds. Then they say if we plant our seeds after the, the, the constellation reappears in early summer, then it's too late. You know, by that time, if we plant, the, the boys are going to stop the rains from coming. They're going to increase the temperatures, the heat, and they're going to burn and bake the seeds that are in the ground. So that's why they say that we don't plant, you know, when, when this constellation is out and about. And then this time of year in, in October, November, this constellation re is um, actually appearing in the eastern um, horizon just after sunset. And when this constellation appears on that side after sunset, it's a reminder of our ceremonies to begin for the winter, our winter storytelling time, and our big ceremonies like the Nightway Yebiche, which is a 10 day healing ceremony, begins when this constellation reappears to the east. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. there's a lot more that I could talk about. There's a lot more that I could share. But, um, I just want to share this much with all of you to, to kind of just give you an appetizer, if you will, an introduction to our stories and our view, just to share how important the night sky is to us as Navajo people from our cultural perspective. Um, and we have similar constellations like Orion, which to us is has a Navajo name of Atsa um, Oza, which is the slender one, story of warrior warriorship. Then we have uh, Scorpius, um, which for us is Atsa Atso, which is the, the elder and the wise one. Uh, but we have many more constellations, um, and, and obviously we don't have enough time to share all of that. But as an introduction, you know, I, I want to share this much with all of you. Um, and maybe maybe somewhere down the line, you know, you'll be able to learn more about the cultural aspects, not just of the Navajo, but many of the other Native American tribes in the in the United States and other indigenous cultures around the world, because you know, these stories um, have been around for, for hundreds and thousands of years, almost longer than the science that many of us can comprehend today. But these stories, you know, they, they hold a lot of truth, a lot of knowledge. Um, so I encourage all of you guys to, to take an interest in hearing that perspective. But for now, I want to I stop and, and I want to say a to each of you. 
thank you for allowing me allowing me this time to speak and to share and to enlighten you all with our stories. Uh, so I'll quit it though, Liz. That'll be all, and I'll hand the, the floor back over to you all. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, here, here you are. Super interesting and really inspiring. The comments are just, there are no questions, just uh, uh, inspiring, beautiful. And uh, to share the stories of, uh, you know, the, the, it's like the origin, the cosmovision is really inspiring for all of us. Uh, I am from, we, we still have five minutes <laughs> to to be on your talk. So, uh, for instance, I am in, in South America and I, I grew up in the Atacama Desert, which is probably very uh, similar conditions as um, in the Alamo, where all, all the places you are. And and the, the, sto the stars tell a story of uh, of how everything was created, and when you when you show when you uh, to say, you you said something like uh, we share the indigenous uh, similar stories, and probably uh, we we now have the Greek, uh, which as it was the indigenous of that time that the, the Milky Way is a splash of milk of Hera, the wife of Zeus, and uh, all this uh, different uh, image that relate to the, the core of the culture was there in the sky to explain uh, the cosmovision of every single uh, cultural uh, of every single people, like like uh, uh, the country or cultural, the uh, I don't know how to say it in English. I'm sorry, but uh, in North America and South America, in New Zealand, uh, they were telling how the, the the constellations were having a different name. So, have you? Um, uh, do you know any other uh, stories? beside your story that uh, are s s like fascinating or share some some uh, common background in this, the, the constellation. Uh, <laughs> I, uh, yeah, I, I, I get I get what you're trying to say. And um, uh, yes, there there are, you know, I don't know the stories, you know, completely on a lot of these constellations uh, pertaining to other tribes and other cultures, um, but I've been introduced to them. I've, I've heard some stories. I've um, uh, spent some time out in Hawaii back in 20, 2018. You know, I worked out there for four months and uh, at the uh, on the island of Maui at Haleakala National Park. And um, they, they also have a lot of respect for the night sky and hearing stories that they have of how they navigated you know, across the waters by following the night sky. Um, very similar to how we navigate, you know, on land here in the Southwest. Um, similar stories there. Um, but there are, I think like major constellations like um, Orion is one of them. I think Orion is one that, you know, is, is very common across many cultures to symbolize, you know, a warrior. Or, or a protector of some sort. Um, so I've heard some stories like that, uh, but but to know the stories of different tribes and cultures personally, um, I, I don't know them enough. And for me, you know, it, it's good to hear them. I love listening to them, um, but they're also not my stories to share. Mm. You know? Yeah, so this I, is really yeah. amazing. Yeah, just I can imagine like when you were talking like movie, uh, like being there and watching all the stars there in in your park and listening to that and this is like a trip to the, the core of our culture even if even though it's, it's not my culture so uh, thank you very much uh, Ravi so we are going to have a session of questions to so 
for everybody. Uh, so is Jairo and Pedro uh, should show up. But in the meantime, uh, there, there is a question from Kenzie that's if you recommend books, uh, Ravis, to know more about your the constellations and the stories. Yeah, there, there is one book. Um, some recent Navajo scholars. Uh, let me look that up really quick, and then I'll, I'll, um, I'll share the name of that book here in a minute. Mm -hmm. So they ask also about the 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 artists that paint the the arts of your presentation. Yeah. So the artist is is also a Navajo artist, and that book that I'm going to recommend is actually where these photos are coming from. So let me get that up. Uh, that the title of that book and then the author and um, artists and names and I'll share that with you all here in a moment. Super. So it, it, it was very interesting this, uh, the, this is the last um, session of regional uh, speakers that we arrived to the Americas and this is very interesting that we started there, central and then south from pole to pole uh, and from different perspectives. So it's, it's very interesting that we started with uh, all this commitment with the community from Jairo and the involvement of the, with the education, science, research, and uh, environmental action to all the work that Pedro has been done for more than 20 years related to regulations first for the astronomical and science, and then involving uh, now environmental uh, issues, and then end up with these poetic visions of how important is most uh, for beyond the science and uh, tourism, and it is uh, something related to our soul, I think, this uh, cosmovision. Uh, so it's uh, a very interesting for me to, to host uh, this. So, uh, I will share some uh, some questions for Jairo. Also, if you want to comment anything, just just say it because it's, uh, we have this uh, twenty minutes of uh, freedom to talk. If you want yeah, to, comment. Well, well, you know, I have something that I wanted to share. I I find I found um, Rav, Ravis um, Ravis um, his story very very inspiring. Um, I can recall from from um, some agriculturist and 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 also um, navigators of the sea as well in 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 this region, especially on our island. They they use um, constellations. They use the moon to to you know um, plant certain certain seeds into the ground and and such. So it is something culturally that I think we are we are somewhat losing but hopefully um everything is recorded in books the stories that for example R ravis has has to share with us these can spark something into into our um our, our youth um which and, and the generation for uh for the forthcoming so so that that's something very inspiring um for us to hear as well yeah I will before <laughs> I will want to add something also because here in in the in the south we don't see the polar star we see the southern cross which uh, for the Andinians or the people that lived around the Andes Incas and uh, everyone like in the north of Chile and South Peru it's um it's called the Chacana and the Chacana is always pointing to the astronomical south so. Every night you can see, you can draw, and you exactly a uh, and south, north line perfectly. Uh, you know it's so the the, the people um, they use it to build the architecture. So you know every night you can do the base of the architecture and the cities and the monuments and the harvests and the, all the work that. Uh, have to do uh, for, for 
uh, harvest uh, orientation of the sun, you can draw a perfect line. And, and that is very amazing because the, the star gives you information plus all the stories, because here in the south we see more stars than in the north. And we have the core of the Milky Way in, in the Senate. So the constellation, the main constellations are the dark areas between all the massive uh, stars. So it's a, it's a different way to, to think uh, or to perceive the sky. So both are really amazing. So ah, going back to, I saw Jairo, you, you answer all the questions, but uh, the, to, there were some comments that I, I think it's, um, it wrap up some of the question uh, from Lisa Heshong, I don't know if I pronounced her name, but is a, there is a, there is a, um, like a, 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 um, a problem that is, for instance, when everybody goes to Aruba, you have this amazing uh, possibility to contemplate the dark sky, uh, all the turtles' protections, that the tourism, the tourism that it can be done uh, with a clean night, and but also the massive tourism is uh, is a threat or not to the to the conservation. So how can you uh, see this? Uh, dilemma yes indeed that that's a good question um so there is a particular group within the the tourists like like to go to the beach and you know experience the leisure that aruba has to offer the the white sands and the beautiful um, um the weather and such but there is a particular group which we call um the the part of astrotourism and we have, um, since we have the, the astronomy organization, um, we have been requested for private stargazing events for, from tourists that come to the islands. So we, we, we have telescopes and such. We like to do outreaches for them, but they, they tell us um, when we ask where they come from, they usually come from large cities such as New York, for example, or Los Angeles, for example, or Amsterdam, for example. So these are places that they can't experience the beautiful night sky that is still available on the island of Aruba. So <clears throat> that is something that, that we found very interesting. And I think it's something that we need to protect and, and to take leverages of that to, um, to communicate with the authorities and hotels and, and all of the development that is going on on the island so that we can protect it and also um, promote that branch of astrotourism as well. So that is something that, that I think hand in hand, they need to be aligned somehow. And I think as delegates, we, we, can, we can certainly do that um, in, in, you know, by promoting and raising the awareness, just giving all the words the, uh, out there so that um, eventually it will reach the authorities, you know, or the government institutions as well. So it's a, it's a final goal to make something like a regulation? Sorry? It's, a, it's a, like a final goal to involve uh, all these intentions with regulations? Yes, yes. The final goal is especially um, because we, we on the island have uh, many ordinances and laws, but these are mostly directed to, you know, the waste management, um, um, sound ordinance, um, hindrance and such, but um, we don't have uh, many such laws that include the light pollution impact. So eventually with our advocacy, the intention is to to raise the awareness and some way include that in some type of ordinance and law. And especially if uh, we can have a good collaboration with the national park here to reach up to uh, a type of national um, dark sky park as well. I know IDA uh, has strict requirements and, and I think that's a good purpose for a good purpose as well. 
but <clears throat> I think um, we can we can set that as a goal and reach that eventually. Yeah, that will be amazing. So also there, there was a question related to and how you um, conduct the, the the survey related to how you you select the interviews. You already answered that, but this is for the record. yeah yeah. Yeah, that, that's a that's a good question. Um, uh, the survey is, I can say for a fact, historically the first one that ever perf was performed on the island in the community. So we have we have used a special program um, we found online that can be um, directed towards only the Aromi community and 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 not any other islands or countries in the region, so that we could have a good um idea of what is the knowledge and and it's 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 very simple 10 10 questions um it was running for only two weeks but eventually we will do a follow-up uh, survey especially asking the community what are the ideas they have or thought of that could have um um lowered the the impact of or mitigated the impact um, for the for uh, um, you know um, raising the awareness as well as installing a good practice and, and and practical solutions for installing all of the lighting fixtures and such. So I think um, that's that's the the initial survey. You know, quantifying what is the knowledge so that we could do a follow up and and. And while doing the survey as well, it's very interesting that we also gain the attention of the or are gaining the attention of the government. So Aruba is, is a small island, and that's the benefit of, of living on a small island. Everyone, everybody knows each other. So mm -hmm. even the ministers and you know the authorities authorities as well. So that's that's something that we will need need to take into advantage for us at ID adv advocates. Yes, it's a great uh, opportunity to do good lighting that promote tourism and at the same time is a, is a challenge to for the night uh, sky protection. So it's a uh, it's a good challenge and it's so congratulations for for everything. So now uh, there is some uh, also if you want to comment on anything, please uh, make questions also, but. From Pedro, there was um, some questions I saw already that you answered most of them. Uh, if there's, if there now with the new regulation that is coming, if there's any pushback from the public and politically and or the new lighting requirements in Chile, if there's any uh, pushback from the policy politicians. Well, in general, we have uh, some reluctance uh, from authorities that uh, keep the old traditional way of lighting as, as a standard. And I think that anytime people understand the environment, this reluctance is reduced or abolished or eliminated. So mm -hmm. we think that if we can relate environmental issues with light pollution, even climate change, we will have more force to change the minds of the people who are reluctant. And in, in terms of the technical point of view, we have all this now available from the main manufacturers in order to provide amber LED everywhere in the world. So there is no technical restriction nowadays in order to provide for any manufacturer the optics in order to to uh, have and produce uh, fixtures without uh, blue light and i think that will be a global goal for our community to avoid blue light almost everywhere <laughs> yeah we we have uh, the, uh, you know <laughs> as a lighting designer I, I have some comments but i will keep uh, there is also um this the the, uh, another question was if there was some uh, coordination with the business community. 
Yes, in, in fact, we have been prepared in the situation. We have been doing pilot projects in mines in order to demonstrate that it's completely possible to combine good environmental protection together with the typical operational conditions and requirements of security and safety in the mine sector or in general in the industrial sector. So with those pilot projects, we think we have been preparing the scenario in order to have a good support for a, imagine that we are we are now almost ready to have a complete a complete new norm for the whole country for almost 19 million people just in a, in a couple of months i think and so having pilot projects demonstrating that it's possible to combine all the requirements even the environmental, the technical, is it, it, a good way to, to have the approval of all, all, all of the sectors in, in the country. And we hope that with this, we will be ready to, to, to install a, a new kind of regulation, more, much more drastic in terms of environmental aspects. Mm -hmm. I think the challenge is to uh, involve all the environmental issues and protection of the Nazca to for science and nature, but also include the possibility to make amazing uh, cities to, to to be possible to enjoy the night sky, uh, glare control and all these things that we care when we design the urban environment for for. Um, uh, the quality of life, but also the possibility to for tourism and so on. So I think it's possible, and that is a challenge. And uh, also, it's a very uh, interesting thing to to add to this question that uh, industry, for instance, the the lighting industry, um, first of course complain about this regulation, but then they they. They have an answer because now with LED is easy to to uh, provide a uh, different color temperature. This is not uh, this is not a problem to change photometry. So the the big industry is is uh, is having a good um, answer. We now we are able to to design with with all these regulations. So it's it's interesting. And, uh, but and but the only option, the only option is to reduce the lighting levels everywhere, almost everywhere. It's it's, uh, it's yeah, I think it's a. Uh, if this is rather difficult for the lighting engineers in general to do that. But yeah, because we have to work with lighting designers because then we know exactly what how much light is enough is good enough for 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 the night environments because yeah, we have for. And in the, in the case of the lighting designers, it's very interesting that first they have to focus on environmental issues and then provide technical support for all of the industry in general. But I think that the, the main goal has to be environmental protection and after that, all the rest, because otherwise we, we will not survive for for, for for a long for a while because we are under a very humanities in general under a, a huge risk and we are just starting to face the situation the climate change the, the name is very bad in fact it's not climate change it's a, it's climate disaster <laughs> that we are starting we are just starting to face and if we put as a priority the environment we will survive. Otherwise, perhaps not. Mm -hmm. So, okay, and I think the questions uh, are... Yeah. So... Uh, I think from Ravis, it's just uh, inspiring inspiration <laughs> uh, comments. Uh, okay, there's a question. 
<laughs> but you already answered also. But in certain times of the year, your traditions where it's considered more proper, where it's considered more proper to discuss astronomy and nice sky knowledge, and other times where is no that where is the best time to talk about this according to yeah. You? Yeah, I want to also answer two other questions at the same time. But um, in regards to us as Navajo people, most of our creation stories are told in the winter time. We don't speak about them in the summertime. Um, so the story I shared of the coyote, you know, the coyote and how the stars came to be, that's a winter story time. Um, but talking about constellations and talking about the teachings behind the constellations, those can be talked about year round. But when it deals with our creation stories and oral stories, um, we only speak about them in the winter time. Mm -hmm. and that's typically from mid-October through the end of February. And after that, we put our stories away until the next winter season. Um, so is it but, um, the, the night is longer? No, correct. When the nights are longer is when we, when we share our stories. Um, but there was also another question on there about light pollution. And for us as Navajo people, um, for a very long time, you know, living on the Navajo Nation, the reservation um, in the United States, we, we've had many homes that are off grid. Um, so we, we don't have adequate access to running water. Um, we hadn't had a lot of um, access to electricity. Um, so that's provided a lot of beautiful night skies for, for our homelands. Um, but in recent years, in the last decade or so, there's been major increases in street lights, um, more homes getting connected to the grid, more electricity being uh, readily available for homes. And that's beginning to affect our, our night sky. You know, uh, it's beginning to affect the view of the night sky. Uh, fortunately, it, it's not great, you know, greatly affected like other regions across the country and across the world. Um, and we're still, I feel like in, in a beginning stage to where we still have a lot of leverage if we can make the right calls and get the right people on board to slow down and think about this more in a um, respectful manner. Um, but we are experiencing um, interference with light pollution um, on the Navajo Nation. Um, and then the last question I've been, uh, there's several questions that are relating to this and it's talking about um, how to share our stories. Um, one, it's always best for the people to share their own stories. You know, um, I wouldn't I wouldn't speak about Hopi stories, or, or I wouldn't speak about you know Aboriginal stories, or more Hawaiian stories. You know, I'm I'm not of those tribes. You know, me being Navajo, I I share the Navajo stories, um, and it's it's you know the best respect that you can have out there. But I know we want to share stories, and we want to be open to allowing people to to share on our behalf. And that's where I think proper um, tribal consultation and tr um, tribal involvement, engagement with your programs are very key. Uh, I don't recommend you share any of these, you know, cultural stories unless you have your sources and you have, you know, the approval of people from that tribe to share that story. Um, and when you do, when you are sharing these stories, you know, give the credit where, where, where it needs to be. Um, that's the most important thing, you know, especially here in the United States. Um, we need to give credit to the tribes that, that these stories are coming from and the histories. Um, so that's that's my recommendation and advice for those of you guys who want to, you know, learn more and, and be able to share that information. Um, try to go with it, you know, with a respectful approach. Think of it as if, you know, your own family stories. Would you want someone to tell, you know, your family stories to the rest of the world without your approval? Um, so just a little bit, you know, in that respect, but um, yeah, I'll I'll hand the floor back over to you, Pauline. <laughs> so thank you very much. We are on time, so it's uh, fantastic to be in this session with uh, you, the three of you. So we are going to say goodbye and thank everybody that has been with us from many, many countries. I forgot to mention Trinidad and Tobago. Okay. Verde or Cabo Verde, I pronounce it. So I'm from all the countries all around the world. So it's, uh, it's really amazing in this uh, uh, Under One Sky Global uh, uh, event. So thank you much to all of you. And uh, we'll see you soon in the next 
engagement workshop that starts uh, after this. Uh, in at it's uh, in 10, 15 minutes more. Uh, it's about policy. So the chair will be Jana Yakushina. With uh, she will uh, host with them. It's uh, the panelists will be Amy Oliver, Diane Turnshek, and Anna Paskova. So don't miss the next one. And thank you very much to be with us. Bye.